So here's our goal for our last section here. Uh, we're going to learn about the remaining three formulas that are on the back of your periodic table. And some of you actually were already getting to that point on your lab the other day, which I thought was awesome. So I'm going to show you in a bit more detail how to use the power formula, the energy formula, and the efficiency formula. But really, as I work our way there, I want to focus on energy and how it affects the environment, because that's actually where those formulas are based off of. So but before I do any of that, then, let's, let's talk again about our whole point of our unit. It's all about electricity. Okay? Electricity does not just magically show up when you plug something into an outlet. Right? And I think that uh, sometimes we forget that. We just go, oh, I need to recharge my phone. Where's an outlet? I just plug it right in. But someone has to pay for that. It has to come from somewhere. Electricity doesn't just like magically show up. So how do we make our electricity? Do you guys remember? What is like the, the, the science behind how we make electricity? Anybody want to take a stab at this? How do we make electricity? Yeah, but how do we get that flow of particles? Electromagnetic induction. Okay. You said it to her, you didn't say it out loud. Here, let's do a quick review of a story here. It was 1831, okay, and it was Faraday, and he was playing around trying to, trying to discover things, and he realized that if he put a magnet inside a coil of wire, it could cause electron flow. And he really discovered the whole electromagnetic part of it. Right? And I even showed you guys that in the lab. Remember how I took that little coil of wire, I took the magnet, and I put the magnet inside, and as I put it inside, it caused the little needle to deflect. And as I pulled the magnet back out, it caused the needle to deflect the other way. Right? That, that's electromagnetic induction. Now, since then, we've got a lot smarter with how we do things. Okay? Rather, than, um, rather than having to like, physically like, move a magnet inside and out of a coil of wire, we actually try to use natural resources to do that for us. You guys with me here? And I've got a picture right here of, of basically what ends up happening. The key is this thing right here. It's called a turbine. I've used this word before. Basically, the idea is that if you can spin a turbine, the turbine can spin the, the wire inside a magnet. I believe that these two orange things right here are probably magnets. And as this wire spins, it generates electricity through electromagnetic induction. But the question then is, how do you get the turbine to spin? Now, there's a few ways that we have. One is that we use, say, hydroelectric power or we use windmills, or we use tides. But there, there's more ways to get a turbine to spin than just those. One of the other things we can use is fossil fuels. You guys know what fossil fuels are? Like oil, gas, coal, you know, things along those lines. What we do is we burn them. Okay? You guys have probably heard this at some point before, but when we burn them, it's actually bad for the environment. But maybe the question is, well, like, when we burn natural gas, how does it make electricity? Well, here's a picture that helps describe this. Let's say that right here, you're going to burn something. I don't care what it is you burn. Here it said coal, but it could be oil or, or natural gas. But you're going to burn something right here. As you burn it, it creates a fire. Lights on fire. And what it is, is it takes water right here. And it takes the water and it turns it into steam, okay, like liquid water vapor. And the steam then goes rushing through the pipe. Well, as the steam goes rushing through this pipe right here, as it pushes the fan of the turbine, it causes the turbine to spin. And so the steam goes through here and goes round and round and round and round and round in circles through there. Well, now the turbine is spinning. You know how just like in the same way that the wind, our windmills out in southern Alberta, cause the turbines to go around? Well, rather than it being wind that does it, it's just really hot water, compressed water. Right? Well, then what ends up happening, though, is we need to cycle. So as the steam goes all the way through here, it comes back through this pipe right here, and they have a cooling tower right here. And what it does is it recools the steam back into water. Why? Well, now this water re-gets heated by the fire, and it goes through the loop again. It turns into gas. The gas pushes the turbine. It goes through here again turns back into water so that it can get returned back into a gas. And the whole time it's doing that, this turbine is spinning, causing electricity. Why is it causing electricity, though? Electromagnetic induction. You take a coil of wire and a magnet and spin it, you can create electricity. But the whole point of it is, how do you spin the turbine? So there are some excellent ways that we can spin the turbine without it damaging our environment, like, say, tidal power, hydroelectric power. Um, wind power. 
But truth be told, that's not where most of our energy comes from. Most of our energy comes from fossil fuels. What's one of the downsides to um, wind power? Why, why is wind power not always reliable? What if it's not always windy? Yeah. What's one of the downsides to solar power? But here's one of the great things about burning fossil fuels. Although they aren't as good for the environment, I, I, fossil fuels don't burn only when it's sunny or when it's windy. You can always burn a fossil fuel. Does that make sense? And so we often use these guys right here because not only are they cheap, but they're reliable. Okay? Right now, it's actually really prevalent in the news. Uh, in any of the science and society readings I give you, any of you guys ever read about Elon Musk? He's the guy who created Tesla. And he actually has a really innovative project happening right now in Australia. Has anybody heard of this? What's happening in Australia? What was that? No, go ahead. Do you know? No, it's not to do with kangaroos. Does anybody know? What's he doing in Australia? He's doing that too. That's not actually this part, but he is doing that too. He, uh, he just recently completed a contract with the government or the state somewhere there where he tried to build them like the world's biggest battery. Okay. And the reason why is that they want to try to get off of fossil fuels. And so he built them a really big battery so they can use, I believe it was solar panel, solar, solar power. But the problem is, is that solar panel, solar power is very intermittent, right? Like it doesn't work when it's dark out. It doesn't work if it's cloudy. And so he built them a massive battery to hopefully store all the electricity so that when it's not sunny outside, they still have electricity at their disposal through this massive storage battery. Does that make sense? So it's really big in the news because they're curious to see whether this will solve their problem. And if it does, they may be able to get away from using coal because I believe Australia is one of the world's biggest coal producers. Okay? Um, anyways, I got off topic here. The whole point behind this, though, is that if you want to create electricity, though, you need to have something spinning a turbine somehow. And if you use fossil fuels, what ends up happening is as you burn, as this burning happens right here, it releases carbon dioxide, it also releases nitri nitrogen oxides. And there's a lot of nasty things that end up getting put into our environment that is environmentally unfriendly. So if we can find a way to spin this turbine without using one of these guys right here, it's better for the environment. Does that make sense? I think my next slide is going to talk about that. There are these other ways of generating electricity. Okay. Uh, this one we've already talked about, wind and hydro and solar and tidal. All of these ways are about spinning a turbine. Does anybody know what geothermal energy is, though? It's a little different. It's not about spinning a turbine as much. There's a different mechanism here. Anybody know? Heat from what, though? Yeah, heat from the earth. I actually have family friends who have one of these systems in their house. It's a geothermal heating system. Here's how it works. You have your house. Okay, this is your house. And what they do is they drill really, really deep. They drill two columns. I think it's two columns. Very, very deep inside the earth. And what ends up happening is the earth itself is a source of heat. There's a lot of warmth inside the earth. And so let's say that you want to cool your house down. Let's say you want air conditioning. Rather than pumping the heat from your house outside, you actually end up pumping it into the ground. But let's say that you want to heat your house. Rather than burning fossil fuels, what you do is you take the heat from the earth and use it to help heat your house up instead. And so you actually you use the earth the Earth's natural temperature to help either warm or cool things down. Uh, it does. I mean, you still need to have an extra system on top of that, but it helps regulate the temperature a lot better. You basically either pump the heat away or bring it back in from the Earth. Um, but like, it, it only it only works so far. So like, if it's like say plus 40 outside, you still need to have your air conditioner running still too. But but it can help. Does that make sense? So that's geothermal. You use the Earth's natural temperature to do this. There's another. There's actually a, another way that you can see this. Does anybody know what a geyser is? Anybody ever seen one of those where like literally hot air and hot water is spewing from the ground? There's a lot of them in um, uh, um, uh, New Zealand has a lot of these. There's also, uh, what's it called, Old Faithful in the United States. You ever seen this one before? Where it basically it spews hot steam and gas directly out of the earth. Right? And so that's geothermal where we use the earth's own natural heat to heat things. There's also one more way we can make electricity. It's called biomass. Um, some of you may have read one of my Science and Society articles about how in, uh, in Africa they have a huge problem with um, human waste. When people go to the bathroom, sometimes they don't have like a nice bathroom to go to. They literally have to go in like a ditch. 
Anybody ever see this article where we talk about this before? You read this one? What they're trying to do, what a, what a company's trying to do is rather than have people not only go in unsanitary places where they go to the bathroom, but they're also going to use human waste as, as fuel. And they're trying to take, literally they're trying to take poop and turn it into fuel, okay? which is a two-in-one problem solver. Number one, it gets rid of the unsanitary conditions because just literally pooping in a ditch is kind of gross and it makes a huge amount of disease. But two, it also makes money then because when you want to heat things, if you literally burn your own feces, burn your own poop, well, obviously they do it in a controlled setting, but if they use that, that's biomass. Okay. The idea basically is where you use something biological and use it to create your fuel instead. We call that biomass. So, um, even farming. Any of you guys use like fertilizers? We use manure as fertilizing, right? It's kind of a similar concept to that. Only rather than using it as a fertilizer, though, we're using it as a source of fuel. That's all. So, okay, I want to move on here, though. So, long story short, I need you guys to be able to categorize different sources of energy. And they fall into one of two categories. And I think you guys have heard these words before, but if you haven't, let me go through them anyways. The words are renewable and non-renewable. Okay? A renewable resource is something that you can use again and again, where it is not going to run out. Okay? Renewable will not run out. You can use it again. And the typical renewable resources are wind. If, if it stops being windy today, it'll probably be windy again tomorrow. Right? Tides, the sun. It may not be sunny right now, but it will be sunny again. Okay, geothermal. Trees, actually, by the way, trees are actually renewable resources as long as we don't destroy a forest so far that it can't come back. Because you know how you can always just plant more trees? That's one of the dicey things, though, is that if we were to clear cut so much forest, it may actually ruin the ecosystem. But as long as we keep replenishing and we plant more trees and naturally more tree growth occurs, that then trees are a renewable resource. Okay? But in theory, we, we could be very, very dangerous and clear cut the whole Amazon rainforest, and, and then maybe trees wouldn't be renewable. So that's why this one has a couple little stars next to it. What was that? That would, yeah. But uh, conservation efforts have prevented us from doing too much clear cutting. Uh, under non-renewable resources, we're talking all our fossil fuels. So the main ones are going to be oil, coal, and gas. Do you guys know why we call them fossil fuels, by the way? Anybody know why we call them that? Yeah, the idea is that they're believed to be fossilized plants and animals from millions of years ago that have turned into gas and oil through a lot of hemp temperature and pressure. And so they were once fossils. You know, like um, like when you find like dinosaur remains, only they they have they've been chemically reacted and they've been changed due to heat and pressure to the point where now they're they're gas or or oil of some kind. So they're based on fossils, though. Why, why do fossil fuels matter then? Why 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 is that such a big thing in the news? You guys ever heard of the whole carbon tax thing? Because that's really big nowadays, carbon tax. The reason why is that when we burn. When we burn something and we combust it, it always makes two things. It makes water and it makes carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide causes problems because carbon dioxide creates uh, what's called the greenhouse effect. As the sun comes and illuminates the earth and heats us up, the sun keeps us warm, most of that is supposed to come in as light. But much of it is supposed to actually get kicked off and, and reflected off of the earth. But what ends up happening is we have an atmosphere, and our atmosphere contains carbon dioxide molecules. What ends up happening is although some of the energy is supposed to leave, some of it doesn't, and it actually gets retrapped again. And as more and more carbon dioxide builds up, it creates what's called the greenhouse effect. And the Earth slowly but surely gets warmer and warmer and warmer. Kind of like how a greenhouse in like the, the spring or even the wintertime is kept warm inside a greenhouse to grow plants. That's kind of the same concept here. There's so much carbon dioxide, it prevents the energy, the heat. Some of it wants to leave. That heat wants to leave, but it can't. It gets reflected back in, and we start to heat up slowly but surely. Now, carbon dioxide is the, is the main one you'll hear in the news, hence the term a carbon tax. Okay? But there's actually worse things than carbon dioxide. 
sulfur dioxide, nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide. There are many different things that actually are, are known as the greenhouse gases, but this is the big one nowadays, carbon dioxide, hence the term carbon tax. Okay. And so what governments are trying to do is to prevent people from using so much electricity, especially from non um, environmentally friendly sources that they're, they're charging they're charging a tax to try to prevent people from wasting things. Okay. So that leads us to kind of the second half of my lesson here. This is where we're going to do some math. Um, you guys ever like say go to the store and you want to say buy like say a light bulb? Okay. Energy smart. <laughs> so the, the new like light bulbs are a great example of this. Like the old fashioned light bulbs that we used to use are very bad, they're very inefficient. And one of the reasons why is that they don't actually give off a lot of light. They actually waste a lot of energy in the form of heat. But now we have these new like longer lasting light bulbs. And maybe you're, you'd see something like this on the side of the package. I wanna focus on this right here. It says that it's a 100 watt replacement. And rather than using 100 watts, this light bulb is being branded as only using 26 watts. You guys ever seen something like that before where it talks about wattage and it says this is an energy efficient device, buy this one, it's energy efficient. What I want to do now is talk to you guys about why it's energy efficient, uh, what the math behind it is, and, and why that's useful to us from an environmentally point of view. Okay? But it's based on these energy efficient devices here. Okay? So here's a, here's a formula I need to show you. It's called power. Well, I, let me just start with this actually. Let's talk about power. Power is defined as the rate at which a device converts energy. Okay. Power is the rate at which a device uses energy. I want to give you an example here. Let's say that you were using a 100 watt bulb. Here's what this means. It means that you use 100 joules of energy every second. A 100 watt light bulb, the reason why it's called 100 watts is it means that it uses 100 joules of energy every second. That's a lot. What if you were only using then a 26 watt bulb? What does that mean? Well, it means you're only using 26 joules of energy every second. So long story short, the higher the wattage of a device, the more energy it sucks. And we got to pay for that energy. Okay? I know maybe as, how old are you guys, 14, 13? You probably don't need to worry about your power bill all that often yet. But I can tell you as adults, ask your parents about their concerns about their electricity bills getting higher and higher and higher because that, that's becoming a, a, major, a major financial burden for some people. And when you have to pay for the electricity you use, if I'm using a device that uses 100 joules every second or a device that uses 26 joules every second, I can tell you one of them is going to be cheaper for me to use when I have to pay for my electricity. Does that make sense? That's what wattage is. It's how much energy you use every second. Okay? And so we have a formula here that I need you guys to know here. The units are watts. A watt is the unit we use for power. And uh, energy is measured in joules. Okay. So joules is how much energy you use you know, from, the, from the electrical company, and wattage is how fast you're using it. Okay. If you were to go to a microwave, I wonder whether this one lists on the side here. Give me a second. I'm going to see whether it says how many watts it is. Ah. Yeah, actually it is. It's right here. It says 700 watts right here. Did you guess that? Good for you. Come take a look here later. But the back of the microwave says 700 watts. That means for every second that I run the microwave for, it uses 700 joules. Okay? There are some microwaves that are like 1,100 watts or 2,000 watts. Well, if you're using a more powerful machine, it may cook your food faster. But it's also drawing more electricity, which is going to cost you money too. So anyways, here's the formula we're going to use. It works like this. E equals P times T. The amount of energy you use is the amount of power that the device draws times by how long you use it for. If I use that microwave for one second, it's a little different than if I use it for 20 hours. Right? The longer you use it for, the more energy you're going to need. So let's try a quick example here. Here's our microwave. Uh, so my microwave is 700 watts. Here's one that's 800 watts. So it's using a little more energy. Here's my question. 
if you cook popcorn for two and a half minutes, how many joules of energy are we converting? So how much, how much, how much energy am I going to have to pay for under this circumstance here? Well, hang on one sec here. The formula is energy is equal to your power times your time. But i got to point something out. This is actually one of your assignment questions on the lab. Energy is measured in joules. Power is measured in watts. But time has to be in seconds. So is two and a half minutes in seconds? Divide by 60 or time is by 60? If you took two and a half and divided by 60, you'd get like 0, 0.0 something. Is that how many seconds are in a minute? You're backwards, eh? So what we got to do is we got to take two and a half minutes, and we got to times by 60 seconds in a minute. How many, how many seconds are in two and a half minutes? 150, yeah. Because there's 60 seconds in the first minute, 60 more seconds in the next minute, that's 120, and then 30 more. So yeah, we need 150 seconds. So this is a very simple equation now. To find your energy, take your power and times by your time, but your time has to be in seconds. So if you have a calculator or even your cell phone nearby, what is 800 times by 150? 720,000? Oh, what would you say it was? 120,000. That number there? Okay. That's how many joules of energy you just used. So that might ask the question, is that a lot? Just for popcorn, is that a lot of energy? Well, we don't usually pay by the joule of energy because a joule of energy is actually a hard unit to kind of measure. We actually pay for energy based on... Um, Actually, I'm going to flip ahead a slide, but did everybody manage to do this calculation here? 800 times 150 to get that many, many joules here? Okay. I want to flip ahead to this slide right here. You guys ever seen one of these things outside your house? It's what measures how much electricity ends up getting used. Every, everyone should have one of these outside there. They have, they have newer ones as well, but this is a device that measures how much electricity you use every month. Have you ever seen one of those? It actually measures it in a different unit of, 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 of uh, measurement. Rather than measuring it in joules, it measures it in something called a kilowatt hour, which more or less works the exact same way, only rather than measuring it in watts times seconds, you measure something in kilowatts times by hours. And depending on how many kilowatt hours you use, you then have to pay the price. So I believe it's like five or six cents a kilowatt hour. I don't remember what the exact price is, but it's going up over time. That's how they know how to charge you how much money it was. Was that? Well, that'll work, but then you can't watch Netflix, I guess. Where do you think your the school's got to pay for electricity? She shrugs. Okay, I want to try the exact same question now, but rather than using the formula units for joules, I want to use the units of kilowatt hours. It's the exact same formula. The amount of energy you use, we based on how much power it is times time, but we're going to change things. Rather than measuring things in watts, we're going to measure them in kilowatts. Now, I taught this to the other group about the month ago. They seem to remember this from math class, but I want to give you guys a quick tutorial. Do you guys remember how to convert kilo somethings? It's based on this kind of staircase thing that you guys are supposed to have learned in math, where you go from like kilos to hectos to decas to like centa to milla. Do you guys know the conversion ratio for kilo somethings? It's a thousand. Okay. All you got to do basically is either multiply by a thousand or divide by a thousand. Okay. If you have kilos and you want to figure out what the kilo is in a normal unit, you times by a thousand. If you want to convert it into a kilo something, you divide by a thousand. Okay. It's something that I understand you guys have either learned in math or are working on in math. So here's why this matters then. If we have 800 watts, we have to divide that by 1,000, and that'll give us kilowatts. Okay. So 800 divided by 1,000 is going to give us 0 0.8 kilowatts. Okay, now two and a half minutes. You know how, Courtney, you said to, we were supposed to times by 60, but you said divide by 60? Yeah, if you, though, divide by 60, if you take two and a half and you divide by 60, that'll tell you how many hours you have. 
So anyone have a phone or a calculator nearby? What's two and a half divided by 60? You have a phone in front of you there? <laughs> Beat me to it. Okay, so this is the exact same formula, only in different units. Rather than measuring it in joules and seconds, we can also measure it, listen, stay, stay with me guys, you can also measure it in kilowatts and hours. The only issue is you may have to do a little bit of converting. I took 800 and divided by 1,000 to make it 0.8 kilowatts, and I took 2.5 and, and divided by 60 to get us hours. So, Kayla, have you already done this last calculation? Do you have 0.8 times by 0.416 repeating? 0, 0 0.033 repeating? Okay, so this is how many kilowatt hours gets used. Okay. This is typically the unit of measurement that the power company is going to charge you by. Because they're going to keep track of things not by seconds. That, that, that's, that's too short of a unit. They're going to keep track of it by kilowatt hours. And then I believe that, like we can Google the price. Why don't I actually look it up real quick here? You shouldn't because that's illegal. Kilowatt hour prices, Alberta. Okay, here we go. So the cap, which fully implemented by June 2017 and runs until 2021, will ensure that Albertans pay no more than 6.8 cents per kilowatt hour. The current amount, though, I mean, this is old. This is 2016. was about 3.8 cents per kilowatt hour. So I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but I want to go back to our slide here. That's it was let's let's call it four cents per kilowatt hour. What that means then is for you to run run the microwave. I know that wasn't a whole lot, but keep in mind that was just the microwave for two and a half minutes. Okay, if you were to take however many kilowatt hours you use and times it by four cents, that's how much your bill ends up being at the end of the month. Does that make sense? So I mean, this was using the microwave once. Why don't I just try something real quick here? Let's say that you took a 0 0.8 kilowatt device times it by 0 0.0416 repeating. That's you using the microwave once. Okay. Let's say that you use the microwave every day in the month, and uh, you used it uh, three times a day. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, now if I'm going to times that by four cents then it costs you 12 cents to run your microwave for the month. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot. But keep in mind, that's just your microwave. Now, your television, your cell phone recharging, your, your electric heaters, you get what I'm saying here? Your light bulbs. And it starts to add up over time. Does that make sense? So hopefully what I'm able to show you here then is how to use this formula here. If I give you the amount of wattage that your device is, and I give you how much time it's been, you can now tell me how much energy you're using. And, and like I said, you guys are only 13, 14, however old you are. You probably don't care overly much about your power bills yet, but I promise you, um, when you have to start paying for electricity, it starts to add up a little bit. Um, any of you have parents that go around after you, like turning off lights and yelling, you close the door, turn the lights off? Really? Yeah. I do that with my kids right now. They leave lights on everywhere. It's such a waste of electricity. Okay. Now, the the next question, the next logical question then is, okay, so energy is how much power you use divide, times by the time you use it for. So if I use the device for long, then that's how long it'll be. Um, here, actually, I want to do one more thing here. I'm going to do a new question here. I want to Google, real quick here, the wattage of a, of a television. Hang on. Let's say 58-inch TV. Let's buy this television right here. I want to see how many watts it is. Well, she got the microwave, right? So... <laughs> I don't know why this isn't loading, though. Well, that's what I'm trying to find here. I just my, my internet won't load. 
Yeah, you're right though. This one here might work. Since my internet's not working here. Hmm. Well, I'm wasting time right now. It's not working. Here, why don't we make? Why don't we just make a guess though? I'm actually going to go less than that. This TV back here I actually said it was 100 watts, but you guys are right, though. That TV is pretty, uh, pretty small. Here, let's try this. Let, let's go with just a uh, – let's go with 200 watts. Okay. Let's say that your TV was 200 watts. We've got to convert it to kilowatts, so I'm going to divide by 1,000. So this is how many kilowatts the TV happens to be. Let's say that you run that television for, say uh, – Oh, here, finally loaded. Here, let's see. Say it on here. Need to find its specs there. Specifications. What? Why is it not showing me here? Connectivity. Watts. Here we go. Okay. So they estimate that you're going to use 133 kilowatt hours of annual electricity just for this TV here. But it doesn't actually say what the wattage is itself, though, because I, I want to convert, figure it out. Well, how about this? Let's do this here. The speaker alone on the TV is 20 watts. Let's do that. So just the speaker on the TV is 20 watts. So if I were to take 20 watts and divide by 1,000 to make it kilowatts, how many hours a day do you think your TV is running for? How many, how many hours a day is a rough estimate? Three or four. Three or four? Okay. Let, let's go five. That seems to be about the average here. Let's say that your TV is running for five, five hours a day. And you, your TV runs, let's say that your TV gets turned on most days of the year. So let's say 320 days a year. That makes sense? This would be how many kilowatt hours you'd be using just for the speakers on your TV. Not just for the picture, but just for the speakers. So it was 20 watts for the speaker. Divide by 1,000 to make it kilowatts. Use it for five hours a day, times by most of the days of the year. Okay. So that's how many kilowatts. And we said it was four cents per kilowatt hour. So that means that just to run the speakers on your TV, it's $1.30 every year. But that's just the speakers on your TV. Does that make sense? It adds up, right? So now, what about that light bulb there? What about that refrigerator there? What about, you know what I'm saying here? Okay. Anyways, I should move on here because I wanna I wanna finish our lesson. Here's the here's the next logical question though. You know how I was googling how much power something had by looking it up on the back of my microwave or looking it up on online? Well, we should. I need you guys to know how to find it. Otherwise, if you can't Google it, here's the formula for how to find power, and it's very straightforward. It's how much current you have. Because that's I, current, and you have to times it by your voltage. So all you have to do to find power is take current and times by voltage, and now you'll have how much power a device uses. Okay. So let's try another example here. Let's say that you're using a hair dryer, and your hair dryer says that it's a thousand watts. That is a lot. Yeah. Now keep in mind, you only use your hair dryer for five, ten minutes, maybe, twenty-five minutes, if that. <laughs> Two minutes. So it has a high wattage, though, but you're only using it for a little while. If you plug it into a 120-volt outlet, my question is how much current is there? So here's what I need you guys to be able to do. If I give you the formula power is equal to current times voltage, I'm now going to start plugging in some of the numbers I know. For example, the power was 1,000 watts. That's going to go right here. I did not know current. But I do know the voltage is 120. So I'm literally, I'm replacing this number here and this number here. Yeah, here's where you need to have some math skills. In order to get I by itself, you need to divide both sides by 120. Yeah, basically, I need you guys to be able to do some basic algebra. So 
Do you have a calculator? What is 1,000 divided by 120? Okay. So that's how many amps you're using. Yeah. Or if I go backwards, it works like this. 8.3 amps times by 120 volts made it so that you had a 1,000 1, watt hair dryer. So current times voltage is how you get your power. So there's a second formula you guys need to be able to work with. Do you guys still have your periodic tables? It's on the back of the one from chemistry. You're going to get these formulas on the PAT, but you, you have to know how to use them. Uh, no, they're going to give you a, a, a brand new one with no writing on it. So they will give you one, but they don't give you mine. So. Okay. Now, one more thing we need to talk about here is some devices are not very efficient. Okay. Take, uh, take the light bulbs uh, overhead here. What is a light bulb supposed to create? Well, light. But many devices, they don't just create light. Many devices create heat as well. And often devices are inefficient because they waste energy, creating forms of energy that we don't actually care about. Okay? One of the reasons why is usually due to friction uh, that there's loss of energy. Okay? Um, the way we can calculate that then is we use the formula called efficiency. Efficiency works like this. You take the, uh, the output energy that you receive, that's the energy you actually wanted it to, to turn into, you divide by how much you actually input, times by 100, that's your efficiency. Let me show you that in this picture right here. Okay. In this picture right here, how much input energy did this light bulb receive from the electrical circuit? Yeah, the answer is 100. It input 100. You have to pay for 100 joules of energy. Okay. So that would be this number right here. 100 joules of energy is your input. Now in this picture right here, it says that 5 joules turned into light and the rest turned into heat. How much is the actual output that was useful then? Just the five, right? Because the other 95 joules were like wasted. I don't want a light bulb to heat me up. I want a light bulb to light. Okay. So the way this works then is five divided by 100 times by 100 is going to give you your percent, which is 5%. Many devices then are very inefficient. And so if you can buy a device, I want to I go back. I'll, I'll come back to the slide here again. But when you are purchasing a device, like say uh, those light bulbs right here, if the light bulb is a very inefficient device and you're wasting money, then literally you are spending your money for a device to do something that's not its job. Right? And so if a device is only 5% efficient, you're wasting 95% of your money. So we're hoping to find devices that are, that are energy efficient. Does it say energy efficient on here somewhere? No. I wrote it up here, though. We want to pick efficient devices so that we don't waste our electricity. Well, that's one of the things now is, is a big thing these days is to buy the more expensive light bulbs, but they don't burn out nearly as fast, and they're supposed to be way cheaper. Well, that's the idea. One of the hard times with buying a $14 light bulb, though, is I look at the two and I go, $14 light bulb, $3 light bulb. Well, I want to buy the $3 light bulb, but if it only lasts for two years, and this one's supposed to last guaranteed for 14 years... You know, then hopefully the trade-off is people are going to start buying the, uh, the more energy-efficient devices. Some of the new ones, they actually have guarantees on them. Yeah? Okay, uh, I'm almost done, guys. Let's do a couple last examples, then we'll call her a day. I've only got two slides left here. Um, I had to put a little note on here. You guys may have a previously printed version of these. I had a typo on these beforehand. Are the numbers 334 and 2? Or or did you guys get a non-fixed version? You have 334 and 2? 38. Okay. Can you guys change the 38 to 34? I had to change these because I made a mistake on this one. I don't have the last page. Oh, you're missing the last page? Okay. There's only one more page, so let's write this by hand then. So here's my last example. Let's say that you use a 300 watt hot plate because you're going to try to heat something up. And it produces 34 joules of thermal energy, and you use it for two minutes. We're going to figure out how efficient this device was. So here's how we're going to solve this. We're actually going to use two formulas. One formula is that efficiency is equal to the amount of output energy you get divided by the amount of input energy you have to pay for times by 100. That's a formula we're going to use. 
well, how much output energy does the hot plate actually give us? And it says right here it produces 34 kilojoules of thermal energy. So that's how much output it gave us. We got 34 kilojoules of output energy. However, you guys paying attention here? However, we have to figure out how much energy we paid for. And we have to pay for energy based on the fact that we ran a 300 watt hot plate for two minutes. So I'm going to do like a second formula off to the side here for a bit here. The other formula is that the amount of energy you use is equal to your power times time. How much power does this device draw? 300 watts. How long do we use it for? But do I times it by two? Why 120, Riley? You're right, by the way, but why 120? Yeah, so to convert minutes to seconds, times by 60. Yeah. So two times by 60 makes your time 120. So if anyone has their cell phone or calculator nearby, what's 300 times 120? 36,000? Now that's in joules. So you need to pay for energy as though you use 36,000 joules. Here's the problem, though. This unit right here was in kilojoules. You're going to have to switch one of the two. The most likely thing to do here is let's divide this by 1,000. And if you divide it by 1,000, it means you, you have to pay for 36 kilojoules. So here's the scenario. You are going to pay for using 36 kilojoules. But the hot plate only gave you back 34 kilojoules. Was this 100% efficient? Well, no, it wasted some energy. Okay. But hopefully we can calculate its efficiency. We need to take, I'll use the big calculator here now. You need to take 34, which is how many kilojoules you actually got outputted. You need to divide by 36, which is how much you actually had to pay for, and times by 100. It means your device was, let's call it 94% efficient. That's actually not bad. For a device to be 94% efficient, that makes sense. It's actually a good thing. Because I want to show you guys on my last slide here some common devices that you'll know, and I'll show you how efficient they happen to be on this last slide here. Uh, this came out of your textbook. If you were to drive, say, a gasoline-powered SUV, it uses 675 kilojoules of energy, and only 81 of it gets converted into useful energy, which means you have to take 81 divided by 675 and times by 100. I'm just going to do that real quick here. If you have a, a generic SUV, uh, I pressed the wrong button on my mouse here. 81 divided by 675 times 100 means it's only 12% efficient. Where does the rest of the energy go to? Do you guys know? Through what, though? You're right. Through heat, through friction. You're losing energy inefficiently due to heat. Do you guys know what a what uh, like a radiator, what a cooling system in your car is supposed to do? Well, I guess I probably give it away. It's supposed to cool your car back down. Your car engine is going to get very hot over time, and we need to have coolant in there in order to cool it down, because as it runs, as parts move next to each other, it creates friction. That's why we need to actually have oil in our cars, lubrication to try to prevent them from seizing up. So, long story short, most of the energy that you put into your car is actually wasted. Uh, here, check these ones out here. If you use an incandescent light bulb, 31 out of 780. That is wildly inefficient. Right? If you had a, a baseboard heater, though, look at this one here. If you had an electric baseboard heater, it's actually 9.5 out of 9.5. What percentage would that be? If you had 9.5 out of 9.5? Yeah, 100%. Which kind of makes sense, though, because if... Yes, I'm almost done here. If energy is being lost due to heat, but the device's job is to make heat, then it's probably going to be efficient. Does that make sense? It's very hard for it to be 100. We'll talk, if you ever take higher level of physics, about the laws of thermodynamics. And one of them basically says is that there's always energy being lost due to friction or heat. So it's not possible to go over 100%. But you can sometimes come very close to 100%. But in, in theory, there's almost always a little bit of inefficiency.
Courtney, you okay? Can you give me one more minute of attention then before you get a little goofy? Oh yeah, that's my last slide. Let me do a quick summary here. Here's what we talked about today. I would say four main things I need to be able to do. Four main things here, then I'm done. Number one, I need you guys to know how we make our electricity. We've talked about this a lot, but I need you to know how we make it. You need a turbine to spin. And as the turbine spins, it creates electromagnetic induction. That's how we create our electricity. The big issue, though, is how do you make the turbine spin? Two main ways. You either use a renewable resource like water. Shh. I'm giving you a summary here. This is important. You either use a renewable resource like water or wind or tides, something like that. Or you burn fossil fuels. And the fossil fuels create steam, and that steam turns the turbine. That's number one. I need you to know how electricity gets made. Because it's not free. You don't just plug something into the wall and be like, well, it just comes from nowhere. we got to pay the bill somehow, right? This is where our electricity gets generated from. That's thing number one. Number two, the more electricity you use, the more it's going to cost. And so one of the formulas you need to know is that the amount of energy that you use is equal to power times time. If you can find the power rating on a device and multiply it by time, it's how much energy you use. So I mean, I challenge you guys. Find a device. Like, say, here, there's one more here. Does this have a power rating on the back of it? It doesn't, but find find electric device and find a power rating. The higher the number, the more electricity it uses. So, like, that microwave there uses 700 joules every second. That's the second thing. You should be able to use that formula. Third formula. You might wonder, well, where do, where do you even get that power rating from? If I can't literally look it up on the back of the microwave, how do I get that power rating? Well, the other way we find it is by taking current and timesing by voltage. So those are numbers we've already talked about from our previous formula. Current times by voltage gives you that power. Okay? And then finally, the last thing you need to know is not all devices are efficient. Due to friction and loss of energy, typically due to heat, devices are not 100% efficient. So I need you to be able to use the formula and find out how efficient they are. Honestly, it's the same thing as when you calculate your grades. If you get 7 out of 12 on a test, you go 7 divided by 12 times 100. Right? It's the same thing for this formula here. Okay. If I can give you guys some advice, make sure you know how to use the efficiency formula because I know I have multiple test questions on that on our unit test and on our quiz where I'm going to give you four different devices. I will give you their input and output energies and you've got to calculate which one's the most efficient. So like on this slide right here, if I were to ask you which device is the least efficient, I bet you it's going to be this one here, the incandescent light. Because 31 divided by 780 times 100 is not very efficient. Yeah. Whereas uh, this one right here is not bad. 85 out of 110 times 100, that's a little bit better. Okay. So those four things. Where does our electricity come from? Two, how do we calculate the amount of energy? Power times time. Three, how do you calculate power? Voltage times current. Four, how do you calculate how efficient a device is? Okay. If you can handle those four things, that's what I've covered today. Okay, questions? That makes sense? Okay, so here's the plan, guys. I've now taught you the whole unit. You've learned everything you need to. If I can give some advice, we have 20 minutes left today. Don't pack up and waste the last 20 minutes. That's the advice I always give. Okay, Work on a little bit of stuff at a time. The best thing to work on maybe actually would be the last page of that lab, because a lot of you guys were getting to that power, voltage, uh, current page with some questions on the lab, do that now while it's fresh in your mind. Also, start working on your second assignment, science and society readings, quiz, okay? You guys have work time till Thursday. On Thursday, we're going to write our next quiz, okay? I'm done.